the topic for tonight is moving on up. And really what I want to try and, and point at, if you'll allow me, is moving on from your past or your circumstances. And the reason why I chose that testimony specifically is because there has been no breakthrough for that lady yet. And for a lot of people in life, they, they in a situation or, or their past happened or they're in a circumstance that can't change and it's not up to them to change. And what do you do in that place? How do you live in that place? Especially as a Christian, we, we, we have to have more than just letting that affect us and affect the viewpoint of life and more importantly, the viewpoint of God. Now that's, that's kind of the angle I want to go at tonight. And if you allow me, uh, it might get a little serious at some points and that's okay, but if you just look at your own life and consider your past or consider maybe the circumstance that you're living in and how that might have affected your viewpoint of life or your viewpoint of God and maybe how it is not the way God would want you to live. So I did this, I did this 14-day devotional and this like, you know, you do a devotional on the Uversion app and you expect a different scripture to come up after every day's reading. But the same scripture came up every day for 14 days. And I was kind of thinking, maybe God's trying to tell me something. Um, or it's just a cool devotional. Either way, I started thinking about the scripture and meditating on it. And, and in a way, it just kind of like put everything in perspective. And this, this, this preach I'm going to do tonight is, I'm 28 years. It's kind of the last 28 years of my life, but also kind of summed up in the goodness of God, if that makes sense, if you'll allow me to get, get there at the end. So the scripture says in Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days, that we, may, that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Now, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, hey, God, are you talking about like, when I die? Like, how far is that away, and how much time do I have between now and then? And how do I use that time like, to the best of my ability? Is, is that what you're kind of saying? And I thought about it like, for two or three days, and like I said, for 14 days, the Scripture came up. And then, like, I just looked over my life, and I really like, felt to do an exercise where God said, why don't you look at from the day you were born to where you are now. Look at what happened across your life or over your life. Some of, you know, maybe some, and we're going to look at that now, some serious things, maybe some sad things, maybe some traumatic things. And why don't you think about how those experiences has affected your life and your thinking? And more importantly, how, is, how have those experiences left you perceiving me, God? How have you viewed me based on what has happened in your life? And is that the way I would want you to live? You know, something having, um, I married my beautiful wife is in the crowd. And we have a three-year-old boy who's sleeping or was sleeping in the crowd. He's not going somewhere else. But I was thinking about this. And I was thinking if, if my son, if I knew he was carrying a certain amount of pain or, or he, like a weight, I, I would hope and pray that somehow I'd be able to alleviate that from his life. Somehow I'd be able to assist him to get free of that pain and not live in that position. Who would want to see your child live in a constant state of pain or hurt? Right? You wouldn't want to. And I kind of feel like that's the way God sees us. It's like, I don't want you to live in a constant state of pain or hurt. So I want you to overcome. But the problem with that is, is that unless we're willing to overcome, God can't do anything. We're stuck. And, and more importantly, we, we stuck in our perception of who he is. And this is why, like, this morning was so epic with Chuck talking about our three greatest needs. Identity, love, and affirmation. And how if we don't get those thing, things from God, we're getting them somewhere from life. And, the, and, the, and that is the... That is a problem of why most people end up in positions that they don't want to end up in. Because they have not found those things in God. There's another scripture in Psalm 34, uh, Psalm 39, 4, that says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Now, I'm not trying to tell you tonight that you're going to die. Although that's true at some point in your life, um, as gently as possible. But that's not, that's not what I'm after tonight. But maybe it's good for you to just realize that. And also just have that in your mind. Let me ask you this question. What is it that you are currently enjoying or a part of in life that you think is going to last forever? There's not too many answers to that question, is there? Because even the people we're around, 
the things that we are enjoying, the circumstances we're living in, whether they're favorable or not, will not last forever. There will come a day where that will end. And depending on how attached you are to whatever you think is going to last forever, when that does end, might do something to your life that you don't like. So this is the little exercise I want, I want you to do. I'm going to do it with my life uh, on the screens, and you'll get to see that. But think of, do this with yourself, maybe at home or in the week. Just draw a little line like that. Put your birth date. Yes, I am that young. And, um, you know, put today, or if you want, you can put the infinity sign if that's what suits you. And, and just maybe put on that line maybe five or six things from your past that has happened. That, you, that if you think about back on your life, you can go, oh, that was hectic or that was serious. Maybe it's something you've done. Now, what I'm going to put up there tonight is just some things I've experienced. And I'm going to touch on one more specifically later on. But that doesn't include maybe some of the stupid things I've done. Who's done some stupid things in life? Oh, yes. Okay. You might want to put those there in privacy as well so no one else can see it. But let me just, let me just share what my life with you up until today. See, how my, my life pretty much started when I was six months old. My dad had committed suicide. Now, I'm gonna, I might do this a few times. I just want to do a plug here or a punt for People Matter. You know, I was 26 when I did People Matter for the first time, grief share. And never in my life did I think something that happened when I was six months old would still be inside of me when I was 26. But sitting through that 13-week course, and, and learning how God supports you through something like that, I realized how much of a person I had become out of that experience. And it was quite frightening because I thought, I, I started to understand things about myself that came out of that, and I never even thought about it. But it had shaped my life already. So then at six years, when I was six years old, my mom remarried, um, which was a story in itself. But th- this guy, my stepdad, I, I knew him as dad. First guy in the house. Well, that stayed for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, you can laugh. It's cool. It's chill. It's over. <laughs> Jesus has done a good work. It's fine. Um, so I called him dad and it was like cool. And uh, you know, we, the reason why there's a sailing feature there, because we used to sail on the weekends. And that was kind of like a little family hobby we used to do. And um, they, were, they were together for, for six years. But then when I was 12, they divorced. And I remember, I remember lying on my mom's bed the one night. Like, you know when you cry, but it comes from, like, deep within you. And I was just lying on her bed, like, in a fetal position. I was just crying. And I was just saying to you, you know, oh, it was just so nice to have a dad. You know? I mean, I can't imagine what that did to my poor mother, if having your child say that to you. But I was just, you know, was just, that was just my experience. And... Um, so at 14, to my excitement, they got back together again. And I thought, this is cool. But as I'll tell you later, my stepdad tragically died at the age of 14. Then, at the age of 15, I moved out of home. I had a, a friend that I met in grade 5, or standard 3, if you're old enough for that. And um, when we, <laughs> at standard, beginning of standard 7, or grade 9, I moved out of home and I went to live with them. And I'm very grateful for what his parents did for me. But then at the age of 18, there's a little bit of a silver lining. I got saved. I finished school. I was kind of just working a job. I watched a movie, a Christian movie. I went to a church. The guest speaker from the movie came to the church. Uh, he just like said something, and I was like, this is what I've been missing my whole life. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but everything you're saying is like pulling strings in my heart. And I, I don't know what it is exactly you're offering, but I'm going up for it. I sat in the back of the small little church, and when he did the altar call, not that I knew what that was at the stage, but I just got up and came to the front. Because it's like, whatever you're offering, I'm taking tonight. <laughs> so I went, and my life definitely did change from then. And then um, I worked that job for two years. And then in 2009, when I was 20, I came to Bible college, and I was here for three months. Oh, at the age of 21, my mom passed away. So I was looking at this with the scripture. Teach, teach me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. And I thought to myself, there, there's a few things that have happened in my, that has happened in my life. And out of every one of those experiences, a part of me died and I lost something. Or I, I, or I, I learned a mindset or a way of thinking based on what happened and I kept it to keep me safe. 
to, so I won't extend myself in that way again. I might not trust in that way again. I might not ever get into a relationship in that way again. I might not put security in something like that again. Whatever it is, a few of those things put things within me that just like wall after wall after boundary after protection after like all of this stuff. So, but now the problem is I, I got saved and now I'm in a relationship with God. And, and like I said to you, if you know your child is living in a state of pain, would you want them to stay like that? No, hopefully you would work towards getting them to get free of that pain and free of that hurt and to live in freedom. So that's exactly what God has done. But let me just ask you this. Please will you raise your hand if you've ever been through a difficult time? If you've been through trouble or through something traumatic or you've lost someone, which is something that kind of rocked your boat a bit, something that, keep your hand up because I need to know that I have your attention, okay? Now, you, are, you need to make me a promise. Actually, repeat this after me. Say, I will not shut down when I read the next scripture. Okay, now you made a promise, hey? Because people tend to read the scripture and just go zoop. And you're not allowed to because you made a promise. And the scripture is this in John 16, 33. It says, in this world you will have trouble. Now just based on your hands in the air and what that scripture says, I'd say the Bible is true, right? But you just, you just confirmed the Bible. Thank you for that. But, and this is the part I don't ever think we all get to. But take heart, I have overcome the world. What does that mean? And what does that mean in the context of why you raised your hand? What does that part of the scripture speak into that situation that you, that you thought about when you raised your hand? It says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And here's another scripture that we, we tend to just shut down on because it just seems like one of those Christian things, Christian people say when bad things happen. It's Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. Again, there's a scripture where like, you know, when something hectic happens in your life, that's the last thing you want someone to say to you. And like my fear in, in even talking about this message and bringing it up is that I don't want you to, to, to take a position of, okay, well, bad things are going to happen in my life. I can't, can't do anything about it, so I'll just accept it. No, 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 no. That is not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is when something does happen that is like hectic or traumatic or that you didn't quite expect, you can still trust God to overcome to maybe even bring a breakthrough or healing or a deliverance or whatever. But even if he doesn't, he, you can still overcome regardless of that situation. You can still live in freedom. Now, talking about freedom, I was, and I just want to thank Nat and Terry. You know, I, I took this to them two weeks ago, and I was like, this is on my mind, and da da da, da. And they both like, kind of sat with me, and Natalie made all the media, and Terry helped with some of the points. So if it's a bad preach, you can talk to them. I just, I just brought up the idea. <laughs> so when we're talking about freedom, what, what, like what, what would you think classifies you being free? And I was thinking about some myths. But I would say if you're happy, if you're whole, and if you're at peace, I think you're living in a place of freedom. If you're happy, if you're whole, and if you're at peace, you'll be living in a place of freedom. Now immediately for some of you think, oh, God, I, I missed that boat. Missed the happiness boat. I missed the whole boat. And I definitely missed the peace boat. Like my life has gone far too down the drain for that to happen. And there's some, th- this is for fun, three myths about these things. Myth number one, happiness. You'll only be happy if you have lots of money. Hey, you just think if I, I, mean, I, I mean, anyway, um, you just think like if I can just, you know, maybe earn five grand more a month. Oh. I can get these TV and I have super sport and everything will be fine. You know, or, or I can buy that car that I want. I'll really be happy. But who of you thought that you've got the money and a couple of months later you're like, mm, what happened? Like happiness was supposed to come out of this and it's not there. I don't know what happened. Maybe I need more money. So no, money will not make you happy. What about wholeness? You will never be whole if you haven't been pure. You think... I have screwed up too much to ever be whole again. Let me remind you of that scripture in John 16, 33. But take heart, I have overcome the world. 
How badly you stuffed up does not stop you from being whole, ever. And then myth number three, peace. Now, if you can't make out that photo, there's a bunch of shoulders, shoulders, <laughs> bunch of soldiers, soldiers <laughs> playing soccer in the midst of war. You cannot have peace when you're at war. Or you cannot have peace while you're going through the most hectic situation that your life is ever going to go through. No, 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 you can. Or you cannot have peace when you've just lost everything that you've ever worked for. No, 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 you can. Or you cannot have peace when you've just lost the person you've loved. Love. No, 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 you can. But see, that's the myth is that we think when things go wrong, peace goes out the window. And that's actually when peace steps in. Will you show that first personal pick? That's. Now, I'm the good-looking young boy on the right. Skinny one. <laughs> I think my mom would turn in her grave if she knew I showed that in church. But <laughs> just a joke, you can laugh. Um, so this picture was taken in 2002, and I'm about to tell you a story of why that, that is probably the last picture that my family was ever together in one photo. Probably the last. And funny enough, I only found this picture last week, Saturday, when my stepdad, he's the first gentleman on the left, so it's my mom on the left and my stepdad, then his brother's wife, his brother, then that's my sister, my brother, me in the front, and the two small kids in the front is my stepdad's brother's kids. Okay, so that's probably the last picture that we were all together as a, as a family. And last Saturday, I got a, a Facebook invite from my stepdad's brother. And then he tagged me in this photo. And I already knew that I was going to do this preach. And I thought, oh, how cool is that? I actually can show you what, this hap- what uh, we looked like. So I was 14 at that stage, 13, 14 about. And um, thanks, Ed, you can take that down. Just put the tassel back up. So I want to tell you a story now of how breaking free from your past or, or dealing with your past will allow you to step into a new a newness in God, a, a greater freedom in God. Because see, something happened when I was 14, and little did I realize how much of life was r- being robbed from me because of how I held that experience. Okay, so you saw that picture we used to sail. So what happened is my mom remarried at six uh, to, to my stepdad. They divorced when they were 12. Then at 14, he comes back. And I say to my brother, I can, I can see things are going to go haywire again, yeah, because he can follow the pattern. But when that happens again, I'm going to stay with him. I, I don't know what mom's going to do. She might move out or whatever, but I'm going to stay with him because like, I, I feel like she's a, a, a common denominator in all these things. So I'm going to pick another side and see what happens. So true as Bob, like they, I don't know, they get back together somewhere in the year, and a couple of months later they break up again, or they re-divorce, um, and I stay with him, my mom moves out. So it was about two months, and we go on, we go on holiday to my stepdad's parents. Now, I, don't, I only have met them once before, it's like nine hours down the road, uh, oh, down the road, down the coast, and um, so we, we out on the lagoon. And, and we're sailing, similar to what those guys are doing there. Not as exciting, but that was a cool picture to show. Um, and I don't know, if, in, is anyone familiar with two-man sailing, like a, a catamaran sailing? You know a little bit about that, anyone? A little bit, okay. So there's a thing that's called a trapeze. Okay, so now when the wind is hectic and the boat picks up like that, you hook a cable on yourself here, you wear this little nappy thing, you hook a cable, and then you start, stand on the outside of the boat and you hang. And the idea is to get your way to pull the boat down and then you get maximum speed. So we're out on the lagoon, and, we, and we're sailing, and the wind is pumping, and the waves are, like, crashing, and I'm out on this thing, and we're, like, flying, and the next minute, my stepdad just shouts my name. I know. And I turn to him, and he's out, out cold. So what happens is when you don't release the, the main sail, the boat eventually capsizes. So which happens, shortly thereafter, the boat capsizes. I fly over, because I'm hooked on this cable, so it kind of chucks you, but it's quite fun. But anyway, fly over, land in the water, and I swim over to him, and he's out, and his like, head is kind of like dangling in the water. So 14-year-old boy, I swim over to him, I hold his head up, and I just scream, help, help. Now, and there's a speedboat on the water, and they come over, and they help us up, and it's like just a blur. I, and next minute, I'm, uh, he's in the hospital, 
And he was like asking me what happened. I was like, I don't know. You passed out. I was in the water. Here we are. I don't know. And um, a few days later, you passed away. The 31st of December, 2002. So what had happened in that moment is an aneurysm that he had gotten, which anyway, had popped. And he was unconscious. And the whole thing followed. They operated. Wasn't successful. And he passed away. Now, I'm out there by myself with his family. And now this is all happening, you know. Um, fast forward to two years ago, or last year, we at Young Adult Leaders Camp. And um, now I just really want to honor Simon. If we go on this camp, you would think you've got your young leaders together. You're going to, like, draw them with information about how young leaders are going to run for the next year. And all Simon does, bring a laptop, bring a speaker, and we're going to worship God. And we're going to let God work in our hearts and see what he wants for us for the year ahead. So, like, oh, cool, yeah. We, and we're worshiping, and we're just talking about how no one is unqualified to serve God, and you can do anything for God. You just have to make your life available, and da-da-da-da-da. So we're standing there, and we're worshiping, and we're singing this good, good Father, and I'm just thinking, and I'm saying to God, like, you know, I, I'm so excited about my life, and da-da-da. And it's like God saying to me, but there's something we need to deal with. And now, this is last year. I'm thinking, gosh, what did I do? So on the way, yeah, it was something I said. And um, the next minute, I'm, I'm back in my mind. I'm, I see myself in the water holding my stepdad's head like this. And he's out, and I don't know what's happening. And God says to me, I, I, need, to tell you, I need you to tell me what's going through your mind right now. And what do you feel? And when I, I'm terrified. And that experience absolutely terrified me. And I was like thinking about it and just talking with God in worship. And well, I'm bawling. Like I'm really just opening up to God. And um, he's, he says to me, Unless you choose to trade that identity of fear for a child of God, you're going to be stuck. That happened. And you, you, you understand why God challenged me on that in a, in a, in a, in a um, compassionate way. Is that for me, when my stepdad came back and I chose to stay with him, I made a decision to put my hope and my future and my trust in a man I made a decision to leave my mom to stick with this man because this is going to be my future. Things are going to be right now. This, things are finally going to work out for us because I'm staying with him. And then three months later, he dies with that experience and that accident. You know what? When I left that experience, what I never realized until last year is I never, ever put my trust in anything again to work out for me or, or to go my way or to have a hope or a future. Just surviving, just surviving, just surviving. Hiding all that stuff and just surviving. God was saying to me, I can't let you live like that. Like, you, I want you to be a child of God. And how awesome was it this morning that Chuck Bentley spoke on identity the way he did? Because that's exactly what it was. But you see, for some of us, it's too comfortable to, to let that go. Because we can hide behind our past. It gives us an excuse not to succeed in life. It gives an excuse to, to not succeed in God or not to choose God or, or allow God to work in us. We'd rather stay broken and hurting because that way we don't have to do anything for God. Or we don't have to get out in life and, and trust God for the best. We can just let that experience keep us back there and not let us be free because in that way we're out the spotlight, we're not trusting for anything, and most importantly, we never in the danger of ever getting hurt again, but you're living in a constant place of hurt. You know, we've been doing this series called Safe, Safe or Faithful. Unless you make an effort to be restored in the things that have been holding you back from your past or your circumstances, you'll always live safe. Because living faithful is living as a child of God and is living according to the promises and everything that we allow to expect from Him. You see, for me, it was a big thing to ask God for something. Because I had made a decision based on that experience that I'll never trust in anything again. Because when I did it, that's how it ended. So I'm done. And God was saying, but I can't, I can't work like that with you. That's not who I am to you. And unless you're willing to let me be, let, let me be your father and you be a child of God, we like, this is going to be difficult to move ahead. Now, if we did that timeline, we're going to do a, a worship song now. Then I'm going to come back. But I just want to challenge you and ask you, what has happened in your past or what circumstance are you living in or has affected your perception of God? What have you left undealt with? What, if, what are you living in a lesser state in? 
won't you in this next worship song just at least just speak to God I'm not asking you to do anything big just in worship open yourself up to God and, and even ask Him if you don't know but you know there's something you don't know what ask Him to just gently reveal it to you because God will deal with you one thing at a time He can't possibly unpack all of that in one moment because I, I, I'd, I'd never be able to cope with it but as, as life goes on don't let past experiences or circumstances stop you from living the best in God from having the most in God for seeing God who He is based on the word not based on your experience I'm telling you there's people in this room that have been through some hectic stuff and I can't promise you that it will never happen again and I can't promise you that, you, that life will be perfect from now on but I can promise you that Jesus has overcome the world and with Him and a relationship with Him, you'll be able to overcome anything. It doesn't take the experience or the hurt away, but it gives you someone a shoulder to cry on and that you might find restoration. But let me tell you what, if you don't find restoration in Jesus for the hurt that you have, you'll look for it in abuse of substance. You'll look for it in, 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 in bad relationships. You'll find something that will just give you a moment of peace or freedom, but it's not sustainable. Only Jesus can walk into that place and set you free and give you wholeness, peace. Remember, freedom is happiness, wholeness, and peace. What is stopping you from having those three things? How have you disqualified yourself from having those three things?